start recording. Okay. I'm recording now, so everybody have a sensible face. Now, who's who's the chair? Who's the chair? Who's the chair? I'm going to do the chair. Oh, hello, everybody. It seems that uh, I finally am the chair. I've been waiting for months and months at this moment because I really wanted to do it. And uh, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I suppose that following the agenda, we should start with introductions. Is anybody new to the call who wants to introduce itself, himself, herself? No? No. Nope. Then, should we have any announcement? I don't see any announcement on the document, but if anybody wants to do it, yeah. please raise your hand. No announcement, and then again, I, 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 Whoa, 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 I'm raising my hand, I'm raising my hand. Not, not with the Discord. You, you can't, you reaction. can't raise your hand with Discord. That's the problem. No, so. I'm the chair. I am the chair. I am the one who make the rules. Okay. All right. <laughs> Nicholas, please, please make your announcement. <laughs> My announcement. Oh, how did you do that? <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, you if you wave an emoji, I just thought about it. It's like, what what are those smiles bottom left? Okay. Uh, just, <laughs> okay. But it, it doesn't look like, um, yeah. It, okay. it doesn't persist. Right? Okay. So either you pay attention or it, it's gone. Okay. I do actually have a serious announcement to make, uh, as well as, you know, emojis are cool and things like that. Um, and <laughs> congratulations on being a chair, um, Antonio. Uh, the announcement is, is that at some point we want to make a release this week. Uh, I know that um, Andrea, you've managed to get things in that you want to get into this release. Um, and at some point later on because i read the agenda earlier on uh, we'll be hearing about pydom but we just i just but that's the thing that's that we're just waiting on is just an update in pydom and then we're good to go for the release uh unless there's anything else that anybody else wants to add to this release i think once pydom is done we're good to go uh andrea has two hands up yeah the terminal the under terminal is uh, is in and the, the multiple terminal with, with workers it's not in yet yeah. because today I got distracted, and when my demo starts, uh, you will un you, <laughs> you, you will understand why. Yeah, uh, you, and you'll need lots of coffee for that that demo. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Okay, that's it from me. No more from me. Okay, so we can start with the agenda, and the first agenda item is Andrea with a demo about no more create proxy. Yes. yes. So. Uh, the beginning is, can I share my screen? Sure. All right. At our screen, share. Try to do these. What? You can't see me. Can you see my screen? Mm, yeah. Yes, I, I saw the thumbs up. OK. So this is the thing. And um, can we make this one bigger? Sorry. Sorry. Yes. The front bigger. Yes. Thank you. Yes. So I woke up early this morning to discuss all about um, create proxy, which is a great uh, technical discussion. I don't want to bother you with that. But the gist of it should be represented by this demo. So this is a page I'm using the in Odyssey. I'm using the iDance, which is just a test, a smoke test for uh, the two kind of events. One is just the, the global callback. One is about using uh, a dot, so references. Uh, sorry, um, and the PyDance file is nothing but these. So there is a global version which is sorry which is in here um print version both PyUDI and the micropython are doing this and then there is a class printer which is a reference we have a globally shared printer thing that is the reference so printer dot version um is the callback that will trigger the event. So let's start simple. And uh, this is the result. And I'm going to zoom in as much as I can. 
tools and ooh, and um, and my browser. So we have two buttons. I'm just testing that uh, pointer down, click, blah blah blah. That version pointer down. So they are just printing the event type and the, the runtime version. That's it. That that's the the original idea of the demo. And now I want to do something more. I want to do this. I want to import JS. I want to add either in MicroPython and PyUdite. I want to add a listener, and this listener is just a lambda. So th this is because I know that a given listener uh, accepts a function. Um, and this is just a lambda with an event, maybe e equals to thirds uh, event. And I want to just print that the document received event, and it, 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 it will log, it, it, it will print document type. In this case, is click, so the type is going to be a click. So that's all I've added to this demo. Now let's check again the same page. So I click MicroPython version. Oh, what's going on? So I have a document click, which is exactly what I wanted, document event type click. But then suddenly I have an issue because this listener is added both in MicroPython and PyLide on the document. And what happens with the PyLide is that this borrowed proxy was automatically destroyed at the end of a function call. Try using create proxy or create one scalable. That's lovely because the code is simple. And what I should do is like import pyodide FFI, create proxy, um, and that's it. Um, right? But this is not consistent because we have MicroPython working, pyodide not working, and also strawberry on top. I'm not going to do this right now, but if I add worker attribute to both scripts in here um maybe i should just just do it worker and worker i never tried this I don't spelling, spelling mistake worker. spelling mistake spelling mistake Ooh, work here work. 20 yeah. and, and at line 20 uh, yeah 20. It, it's like worker. having autopilot this isn't it <laughs> Okay, I never tried this in workers, so that was not fun. I have no idea what's going on. So let's skip this <laughs> silly thing also because I'm not in PyScript, I'm in PyDad. So, um, and the worker ex expect, oh, instead of SRC, it should be worker, sorry. Um, let me try again. What's going on? Oh, I'm using import JS. Okay, let's forget about this for now. So let's focus on main. On worker, I gotta tell you, everything is fine. On main, I still have this inconsistency between what MicroPython can do. It, it doesn't matter if it's right or wrong, but it's co not consistent with what PyDad can do. And so we had the discussion this morning and it was all about how, how we are is there any way we can actually create proxy automatically? There are a lot of reasons for not doing that. But at the end of the day, this is a, a pretty 20 lines of code that should work effortlessly anywhere, right? Except here, it should be from PyScript import document instead. And uh, right now, I'm not in PyScript. It's just the core behind PyScript that is trying to figure it out how it should work. So what I thought is that, okay, we have a lot of good arguments for not doing this automatically. So how about we opt in and we see in time how many users also do opt in with this feature. So I'm going to write config only for PyEvent because MicroPython doesn't need anything special as we have seen. Config PyEvents Tomo. PyEvents Tomos does this. It's just say create proxy auto. And right now, because this was a hack done in between meetings and other things today, this is all I came up with. There is an explicit intent from the user perspective, create proxy auto. What does it do? Well, pretty much nothing unless I also enable this, this code that I wrote. Config create proxy auto. I'm gonna 
I want to go through the code and explain you what's going on, but to start with, I just want to save this file. Um, now I am understanding that create proxy is auto, and I want to try again this demo. So now I gotta. Oh, I have logging in the in the code. Uh, you can see here. This is already working and pretty fast. I, I didn't do anything special. It's just working. So now I'm gonna clean the console, the console. Click, click MicroPython version, and I have two document click. Why is that? It's not. It's not an issue. It's not an error. It's actually correct. Because this file, pyevents.py, if you see, is the same file shared between both runtimes. So both runtimes get to add their own listener in the lambda that is just lambda event print document type and blah, blah, blah. So here I have MicroPython version and the event is, is in the DOM. So because it's bubbling up, it's basically reaching the document. Um, from the bottom, and I can do the same with pilot version. What's going on if I click? Oh, you see, the garbage collector is actually doing things, and I have nothing to worry about from a user perspective. So I have, let, let me try again. So I do this, I do this, I click garbage, and there it goes. So what's happening here? I want to. Sh I, I I wrote an email, but you, you of course you've, you you're not aware of this email I wrote. But basically, I think there is a way to proxy and trap proxies all the way down and uh, use the native v, v V8 or JavaScript engine, whatever it is, feature to garbage collect. And so at this point, I have. Um, I'm, I'm trapping, and this is the uh, Pyodide JS. So this happens only if any Pyodide is present on the page, which is part of the issue. But it might not be as bad as I initially thought. So we have a, as proxies an utility that whatever value it is, if it's an object or, or a function, we don't care about any other primitive. Um, it drops the any check that is happening behind the scene. It checks if the, the value is an instance of proxy, which is also a pretty fast, one of the most fast, the, the, or the fastest uh, checks you can do in JS. Uh, this is the fastest. Um, and then it tries to basically trap only once a copy of the value. So following the Pyodide documentation when you do value copy is a way to work around the lack of um, or the need for create proxy create proxy once but you are in charge of trashing that reference whenever it's not referenced anymore and here I'm using a helper library that does a lot of actually it's pretty tiny but it, it does the right thing so in this case I'm Basically, for this loop of things, so as proxy is looped for each argument for every callback, for this loop of thing, I'm just setting the value, the current value, and a weak reference, so I'm not holding this proxy at all anywhere, and I'm just passing back the proxy to the, to the user. And the user is free to not reference the proxy, del the proxy, or clear the proxy, or assign the proxy to none, um, it doesn't really matter. So all I'm doing here is I'm creating a hold reference to value, um, uh, sorry, to, to, to value copy, to the value copy, and then on garbage collector, when this proxy that I've returned um, doesn't exist anymore, sorry, it's here, um, you can see the gone. The value is the value copy, so this is gonna be exactly these. So the copy I'm holding my garbage collector on the JavaScript side is just a, a proxy of that value so that when this proxy which is returned is trashed, it, it's not needed anymore. And here I have the, the copy and I can destroy the 
copy. And as you can see, you can read gone and there's no error whatsoever because the value was just waiting to be destroyed. So this is somehow to me, to my understand, current understanding of how create proxy works, is actually memory leaks instead of enforcing memory leaks. Um, then I have another utility, which is patch args. And args are any argument passed to any function callback. And this is the ugly hack. It's ugly, but it works, and you've seen it already. So I'm trapping primitives calls from the function, and I'm making apply, not recursively calling uh, call dot bank call dot apply. So if I the moment I define function prototype apply and call is the moment I'm basically making any library, any function, anything in JS that uses explicitly function dot call and function dot apply to pass through this logic. So apply it only only when this boolean value is true, will touch arguments, otherwise we just return the native apply this context args. There's no operation overhead whatsoever. And the same goes for call. Whenever a function calls something, and instead of a, a list of arguments, we will have a, a, a variety, variety I don't remember how it's called, but basically the, the functional length can, can expand. And in that case, we have a list of arguments and only when this Boolean, so this is literally a Boolean check, which should not, this is theoretically, I haven't measured the impact of this change, but a Boolean check for each callback call, theoretically, if the engine is smart enough, is the just-in-time compiler works and everything else, it should never impact performance too much. And in this case, only when override function is true, then there is a check for every argument, and only when the argument is either an object, and it's not null because this is JavaScript shenanigans, or is a function, in both cases, we don't want to hold on the value, we just want to hold on the copy of the value so that PyUdite or MicroPython theoretically could do whatever they want. And then we are in charge of calling the destroy whenever such value is not referenced anymore in the code. And so I have this idea of overriding run, run a sync, a run event, because in PolyScript, these primitives, and actually for er anyone using PolyScript, this is what you want to use to either run code, run a sync code, or run event, especially because the interpreter is already bound automatically out of the box. So you have run and you just pass the Python code and everything's fine. So the override method uh, is just these. And you can see the override function boolean check which is just this. The override method is something like, there is a method, in this case, run, run a sync, and it switches on the override function because that's the moment you define stuff and it switches it off once it's done. And then you return methods. And uh, this was uh, probably even too quick hack and probably there are unknowns to discover because I think um, I think there are still those cases where the event is running, what's going on, if stuff happens within the event, does this still work? So this is something I haven't tried and tested yet. But at the same time, I'm super happy that we just basically a Boolean flag that happens to pollute or change or slow down the global apply and call operations um, is all it takes to actually create proxies automatically, give users a choice. So if they use PyUdite, they can use create proxy auto by uh, apply config. And at the same time, this allows us to explore 
this field because the code is done in a way that is not obtrusive at all so that if nobody's using this feature, we can say, okay, that was a bad idea. But if a lot of people start understanding this feature and start using it because they don't want to write different code because this just works in MicroPython and works just fine in Python 2 when it comes from a worker <laughs> inside the JS, yeah. um, I think I think it's a it, it was a worth uh, worth it experiment to to write. Now I'm gonna stop sharing and uh, or, or maybe I shouldn't. And uh, you can just ask your questions, but if you want me to stop sharing my screen, please let me know. I'm just waiting for the chair to recognize that I've got my hand up, but you know, just whenever. He's he's asleep. He's asleep. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> Antonio, wake up. Boo! Yes, so sorry. I, I didn't. I did, no, no, I was listening, but I didn't remember that there was the chair. Sorry. That's why I don't I want know. to. I know. That's why. <laughs> so, yes, Martin, I see you have your hand. Your, your Thank hand. you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman, for the your chairperson. Sorry for that. Um, Andrea, yes. Could I, can you show the code again? And go to the example that you had. Can you run the. Yeah. Oh yeah, and so actually, and and sorry, the running yes. Have a look at the running example of the of the last one that you showed with the overrides in. The actual. Uh, yeah, so you you had the example with the buttons on it. The actual, see the actual running example. Oh, the page, the page. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So and then, yeah. So refresh that, and then hit the GC button. This one? Yeah. Okay, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I just wanted to see because the idea of holding a weak reference to a lambda function, I was like, that was the, the sort of thing I was to see if it made any difference. But no, that's all cool. Uh, uh, wait, the, 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 the lambda function is automatically proxied as a listener and until that listener exists, you won't see, it, it cannot be collected. So this should still right. work. Right, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. In all these operations that are happening behind the scene, I'm hacking behind PyDite's shoulders, basically, because PyDite is using internally a lot of call and apply because every every library uses when it, when, when it comes to uh, foreign interfaces because of the context and everything. They, they, have, they have to use call and apply. So what you want to see, and uh, I can show you that. So what... That so is there, is there any likelihood of clashes if somebody else, some other library, decides to patch, call, and apply? No. No? No, no, no. No, because to do that, they, need, they still need to refer, refer to the, to the original call right. and apply. So nice. whatever they do, they will pass through the original, originally patched call and apply. Nice. Um, and, and that's that's the same the other way around. If there's any library that patches call and apply before we do, right. it really doesn't matter because we are just compensating each other. So in here, I'm just um, I'm just right. trapping, yeah, trapping apply. Whoever patched apply before me has any reason to exist, and that will happen the moment I do this. And the other way around is the same. Once we apply this, if any, any library, but honestly, I don't know many libraries that do this. Uh, actually, I don't know many people in JavaScript world that understand this this specific line. Um, not not trying to show off. It's just that this is a very 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 deep into the hacking trapping world function thing. But this could happen, and because I work in security, I know this stuff because it's a. Uh, it's an entry point for any password you share and you think it's safe because it's a private scope and then you do a private scope thing apply or call and then you're doomed. So this is this is the reason I know this stuff. Not because it's cool, but because it's a hacky as hell and security um, has implications. In this case, we're not checking anything about anything we don't we don't check a value or it's a password or anything is we're just saying is the value an instance of proxy so we are just saying 
whenever, whenever we know that we are running this stuff in PyUdide, and PyProxy exists only because interpreter FFI PyProxy exists, in that case, we are doing something else. Otherwise, we're just returning values. So there's no observability, there's no security concern in here because there's no evaluation and anything. But this, this is already safe enough. It doesn't matter when it happens, it's already safe. Because whatever happened before, if some if somebody actually patched the function prototype before in a way that breaks this, then everyone is doomed, right? Nobody can yeah, use right. the function call or so yeah. th that's the thing. And in this case, the thing is, we just work out of a Boolean uh, check that happens only when run, run async or run event happens. And once again, my only concern and test that I'm missing here is if you, if you try to do weird stuff within an event, because when the event happens, it executes in the Pyodide context. And it doesn't pass through run, run, async, run event. It doesn't pass through anything interpreter related or, or polyscript or PyScript related. It just executes internally. So at that point, I need to understand, is there a way to also kind of force the override function when that happens, when the event happens? But that's probably the next step um, in terms of exploration. Um, I hope I've answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's great. One thing, one thing I wanted to show is that theoretically, I don't know if this is surely not with the dot. I don't know if this works, but if I do this, I'm telling in JavaScript world at least. No, it's not. Um, once this isn't defined, but well, that might be it. Let me try again. Nope. Okay, let me just try. Yeah, so you see there is one document click and now oh it's still there i don't know i don't know what oh, no, the yeah. error, so, uh, one of the two one of the two because there are two micro python is adding on listener and python is, ad, is adding on listener one of the two is is uh, working the other one is not and so whoever is working is able to to have this event only once. Um, that should be a native API thing. Uh, maybe I should do... No, I don't, I don't wanna do this because it, it will defeat completely my demo. So um, <laughs> the thing is that besides errors, when I do this, or before I do that, Ah, oh, gosh, no, the, the, there is an error, so I, I can't I can't explain this. But what I'm saying is that if I do this and I click and then I do collect garbage, um, then you will see the stuff is gone. But actually, <laughs> uh, let me try this. Um, whatever. And it's gonna throw. Fine. And here we have callbacks. So when I do, let me show you this this page. Uh, maybe just the source. So in this case. I have this a similar situation. I have a, um, an element, not the document itself, just a div, an onclick handler, which is a direct uh, assignment to that onclick handler, an add event listener, which is using behind the scene. Uh, actually, is using explicitly the same logic I'm using behind the scenes. So it's remapping arguments, and in this case, we have a click, a function. And in this case, it's more convoluted because it exposes a direct way to, to say, I don't want this to be a proxy or wrapped anyhow. And this is the demo I sent by, by email. And I, I feel like good enough, I can show it. And then I, I, I drop the div null. And so there's no reference anymore. And when I click it, if you check it correctly, it's, it's just removing the node, right? So when I do this, 
and now we click garbage collector you can see that all my proxy stuff is free so the memory is safe it doesn't kick in it doesn't kick in instantly because that's not how that, that, that would make the garbage collector or the the memory observable which is a some some sort of bad thing to happen ever apparently in v8 and um but behind the scene sorry uh let me let me show you again behind the scene and I'm, I'm doing exactly the same logic indeed part of the demo i've just shown is a copy and paste of what i've done in here so here I'm faking a create proxy value because in this case it's just a proxy. But when, when I pass back this proxy, the reference is not the value itself. It's not this value. The reference is the new proxy. And in the JavaScript world, nobody can understand if a proxy is a proxy or not. So that's the trick. But you reference, you reference counting or whatever, however it works in the garbage collector case, um, you're just holding on this reference, new proxy, and luckily enough, new proxy, which is in our case, pi proxy, pi callable, pi whatever kind of proxy it is, but it's still a proxy. You hold the proxy. You don't hold the value that the proxy is holding because that's internal. And so from the garbage collector, from the garbage collector point of view, it's just, is this proxy gone? And nobody in the in the JS world will know that was a proxy, but nobody's referencing it anymore. So here, if the div with uh, this callback or with this on click is gone, nothing is referencing the div. So the div can release all these listeners and the listeners were a proxy and where the proxy gets released, then we remove the value, which was this one. So here we remove the value and we can do value destroy, free value, whatever. In my case, I'm doing um, value destroy and it works seamlessly. And actually I feel like this is a less leaky prone approach than what we have now. Because right now, if you do create proxy, you have to remember to call that value destroy but if you create proxy for for a for a lambda i mean the the natural way to write code is not this or, or maybe it is this you know as a user that you just create proxy and um, because it's a lambda it's a click it might happen whenever it, it is right you do this and you are creating a leak because what you should do instead is this um, click a listener equal blah, and then you do this. But actually, how do you know when it's when when it's invoked? You don't know when it's invoked, and how do you know where to do click listener destroy? So this is counterintuitive, and really, it's hard to explain why. To, I mean. Especially in this case, I'm, I'm, I'm adding an event listener once, right? And, it, and and somebody will say, yeah, but we have a create callable once. Okay, fair enough. But if I do this, when do I know if this has been clicked, if this should be destroyed, if this element at all, in this case is the document, but it could be a button. When do I know when this button is gone? There's no way to know this in the pyodide world and so i don't understand why should we make this more difficult than it should and i think because we have a finalization register because one of the most user useful use cases for pyodide micropython around the dom is to add a listener and to do stuff with python yeah. on sorry Dome. sorry to interrupt. Yeah. i just want to make sure that we we keep the time um I I think I've said everything I had to say, so I'm good to go. No, no, yeah. And if you want to close, answered, that's fine. Uh, hopefully, I've answered all the questions. Uh, real quick feedback. I I think it's really awesome. Um, that's actually something that we've discussed since 
custom customizing interpreters in the config was something that was even before we demoed in PyCon, like something that we discussed. And I think that's a, a, probably the, the best use case for this as a starting point. So yeah, this is a great idea, I think. Can, can I add my, feed, my feedback? I don't think, I mean, I, I, I technically is incredibly cool what, what Andrea did. I don't think it's a good idea to have an option because what what will happen is that you will have libraries who relies which relies on the option being on and libraries which rely on the option being off and they are incompatible and then and then you will start a very weird behavior when you mix them and uh, it's it's i will suggest that we post though kind of work i, I, I think those are yeah both are good arguments uh, i think um anyway so I, let's I move on with the agenda because the, yes the time is I'm, I'm sorry to be long, but it was, uh, for me, a great achievement yeah. today because I managed to do something that I didn't think I could I could do. <laughs> so yeah. that, that, that was cool. Bravo, yeah, bravo, bravo yeah. yes. Uh, I mean, yep. all very <laughs> impressed. Yeah. So uh, the next item in the agenda is PyDOM update. Yeah, I'll, I'll go fast on this, uh, on both, actually. Um, so I'll mainly put those because we are aiming at um releasing um i think i i have a few fixes that i made that i want to get in uh hopefully this this afternoon i can put a few prs to merge uh, i think they should go in before we release um and i'll also put a couple of maybe one or two prs that are not bug fixes but i think some uh, small changes in the api that i think are worth it so those whoever is if you're curious etc once we review it's a tentative so if we disagree i'll just not merge uh, otherwise um, we can just merge and see uh, how it goes the second topic that i added was is related to this actually um so and it's basically i had a couple of hours um of time this weekend and we've been you know yeah very happy to work on technical stuff after a, a break a forced break so we last week we in the invent call we discussed about you know now we're ready to kind of start experimenting with creating uis and having a builder and things like this so my experiment was okay let, let me try and write a simple app and see how can I use PyDOM to actually start creating stuff and how easy it is in the optics of is PyScript providing good building blocks to create UI frameworks and things like this, right? Um, so uh, here's what I came up with in some experiments. Um, let me share. Mm -hmm. Ah, oh, man, I have to give permission a second. And of course, I need to reopen. So give me a second, I'll rejoin the call. Sorry about that. I have a, a little question about PyDOM. Did we change the name of it? Is it, how do I, how do I use PyDOM in my PyScript? Is it from PyWeb? import dom oh i'm muted i'm not muted no you're not muted no. um <laughs> i wasn't muted everyone was just ignoring me no it, it was sorry damaris popped up with travel things so i just wanted to oh. respond to that in a timely fashion but um i don't know oh okay. uh, it, it, it it's changed then it didn't and then it did and i'm not quite sure where we are with it um so all right fabio sorry don't you love when discord is like oh you have updates let me just install them for you when of course you have updates yes. <laughs> okay sorry about that um of course i'm not gonna oh that is weird um oh um this one 
Can you see my screen? Yes. Can you see yourself? Yes. Perfect. All right. So let me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me go from the showing what I came up with first, uh, and then the code. So everything you see here is generated, is not HTML written, and it uses PyDOM basically. Uh, I came up with the idea of starting from basic HTML components that don't have any dependency. Uh, so divs, paragraphs, headers, things like this. And then adding up to how can we make it accessible and whatnot. So forget about the text, it's just dummy text or whatever. Uh, but I, this is a set of mapped uh, base components. Like if you want to create a button, if you want to create inputs, divs, and stuff like that. Um, so this is the code for this div here. Uh, it's just a button with a label and using the when um, decorator explicitly to say when you you create this button, just execute this function. If I click this, it shows you know clicked. Great. The nice thing here is that actually this button here is a PyDOM element. So in fact, I didn't do any changes to the when decorator to, for, for it to understand what type of object it is and handle you know the event when it gets clicked. Same thing happens for inputs. Uh, it should just work out of the box uh, and whatnot. Um, and same for the div. Uh, I added the option to have a style. Um, all of this is just API, not really strategically thought, just you know, two or three hours uh, of, of in the zone kind of coding. Um, I also added a markdown thing. Uh, which basically is in the same vein. Uh, it, you just call Markdown and translate whatever you have in here. So here I have a text area um, that is uh, just text. If I do, uh, Convert. It should convert to proper HTML. Great. Uh, both Markdown and the shoe elements map to external libraries. Uh, more specifically, Markdown maps to Marked, and shoe uh, basically uh, maps to Shoelace. And basically, it maps to the nice thing about Shoelace is that you just add the CDN, and then it's all web components. So it maps really well to this type of idea and basically each element is just tied to a specific tag that it creates uh, whenever it's instantiated so here alert this is the code for alert I, I forgot a parenthesis there uh, you have a button same thing this uh, basically the same thing as the normal button except that this is coming from uh, pyweb dot shoe instead of pyweb UI cards uh, and other complex things you know uh, i'm not gonna go over every every one of them but the nice thing is like even complex um elements like detail or dialogue are actually they work kind of easy to map you know directly there are a few nuances but uh overall it was quite easy to just map everything considering like doing everything and just from two to four hours, you know, uh, probably could summing up everything. Now, the code for this. Um, this is the HTML page and just a bunch of things. The idea is that those dependencies are going to be injected, right, uh, by the specific, um, the specific library that we're uh, mapping to. And, and then this is just like, uh, attaching to the body by a script, script directly. The UI here is all generated, as I mentioned, and it's basically quite um, easy to read. You know, just create a div, an H1, and then you append things to div. You can also just create things directly uh, by doing something like that, uh, you know, um, and whatnot. Um, 
maps, as I mentioned earlier, maps really well with the when decorator because they are the same type. Um, and I also, uh, the whole UI actually is another uh, element that I created called grid. Um, that is basically, uh, it's based on Andrea's idea around uh, using, um, ah, on what's the name of the property? Whatever, CSS template to actually split things in, in, in a proper grid, uh, whatnot. Now, I'm not gonna go over everything. This is just declaring objects and putting them in the DOM and handling um, events. Uh, oh. But I'm gonna show you first the, how elements are declared. Basically, uh, I have descriptors to map to, uh, to JavaScript library, uh, properties. So for each one of the elements, if they have some property, I just declare them with JS property mm -hmm. and we'll see. Um, and then I have an element base, which is a base class that just basically instantiate, uh, initializes the class, uh, instantiate the, the tag itself as an object, and then map all the style op uh, options to the style prop uh, attributes and, and any the properties. All those properties here are basically those JS properties. So if you pass anything in in the constructor, it's gonna map and and uh, basically set the right values for the JS properties. This is another base class, basically to map elements that are that have a content. So like and and this is the whole code for H1, H2, etc. Uh, this is also a little inspired by the LTK uh, library that. Chris did. Uh, it has a little some differences, um, but overall, it just it, it's similar in that way where we just declare the tag and then it takes care of the the rest to to map to the properties. So in this case, uh, button has these properties, and you basically can then um, and then I was back and forth feeling like ah it feels weird to have a capital B whatever. How does it look if we use declare classes with you know, lowercase, whatever. It's all a mix right now. Um, so don't look at that. But uh, uh, to declare things, you just do um, button equals button. And then whatever you have here, you can set, you know, name is equal, whatever. All the values that you pass here, they actually gonna reflect in the JS object. And just because Python provides this, uh, all the, all those properties are in sync with the JavaScript object. So every time I do something like button dot disable equals true, that will map directly to the JS object and, and back. Um, so if, even if you set set anything on the JavaScript side too. In fact, see if, if I do something like this here and do um, dialog like this, and do that like that. True, uh, open equals false. Uh, sorry, equals open. Is it equals just me or the quality of Fabio's stream is very bad? That's Discord. But Andrea, yeah, Andrea yeah. was much better. Oh, I'm, so I probably need to set the right um, width and whatnot. I think Discord optimizes for some someone told me uh so if you can't see i can increase the font sorry sorry about that is it better a bit yeah okay uh but anyway uh the nice thing about it is that a lot of the foundation is already provided by uh, pydom uh i also pro tried another approach which uh, was instead of actually creating objects uh to just create the HTML text to render on the element and stuff like this, but I found it way harder to actually map to properties and keep things in sync, etc. So I just ditched that. I didn't have a lot of time. Uh, I think that. Oh, uh, sorry. That's the for for the foundational elements. Uh, the shoelace ones is basically here, um, and basically it's the same principle. You you always declare the same cl the classes in the same way. Uh, really, there's no difference other than um, just needing to upload 
to basically load the CDN uh, dependencies and the CSS and other things as soon as possible, which I didn't do yet. Uh, but that's the idea. Now, this is just an experiment, um, but probably I think something useful for users to just, because it's quite fast to create UIs anyway, but I think this is a foundational piece that we can, well, this, whatever it will come out uh, of this, I think it's a foundational piece that we can leverage later. And that's it. Impressions, feedback, whatnot. Cool, Andrea. Uh, so, so I I love the lowercase idea for common elements because you don't you don't feel like you need to new anything. It's yeah. Just when you have a button, you have a link, you have a whatever. But with shoelace, uh, it's the other way around. So you have alert with a capitalized A and and, and all the kind of stuff. Um, yeah, that's that's my question. What what do you feel like is is a better approach? Because I think when it comes to Python, it doesn't really matter if you have lowercase or uh, Pascal case uh, yes. classes or buttons. So yeah, that 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 was my my main thing. Is like okay, I, lo I love the button. I, I mean, in the JavaScript world, having no new button, whatever, is just button text. That that's awesome. In Python, it doesn't really matter. So I know it's a very tiny detail uh, around all the stuff you showed, but I yeah. wonder if there are any converging consistency around this this, this uh, demo or mm -hmm. Great question. So I think that's a discussion we need to have. And then I would love to open and have feedback from the community what they feel, uh, what's the best option. I do think, in fact, when I was doing A or link, I was like, well, we, we as we do this, I think those are the foundational brick, uh, building blocks. I think, well, right now, one of the ideas that came up was maybe we should also create aliases or pre-built simplified widgets that are, they just work, but they, they are things that um, novice users expect to, to see instead of the JavaScript, uh, sorry, the HTML constructs, right? Like P or H1 or H2, whatever. That you need to learn the, the, the HTML language to know what they, they are. If you're just someone without technical uh, knowledge, what would you use, right? So create a series of aliases and stuff like this where it's easier at first. Uh, and then you, you, as you graduate into learning, you have access also to the normal, you learn it basically an entry point where you can get something and satisfactions, something working and a satisfaction as a user, great. And as you need to do a little more, you just graduate into learning the, the constructs that are more complex and stuff, just idea. But yes, the reason I, to answer your question, the reason I did the, the lowercase is I just feel, it just feels a little, natural and actually one last thing to to know right i go I, I just can use button as it is um yeah nicholas you had your hand yeah 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 uh, does it work with MicroPython? um that's exactly uh, what i mentioned to an, an andrea this morning uh no because one of the things i have uh, as python fixes is to make it work with Py, right. Py, uh, okay. micro python yeah. So I, I'll try to work on this afternoon to, to make it work. Yeah. What is the problem? What is, what is the, uh, like, just that we rely too much on Pyodai, uh, internals. Uh, so I need to do some, uh, the, the problem really is the whole proxy dance that you have to do with micro, uh, with Pyodide. Um, if, if Andrea's thing, <laughs> I was just about to say, if in... only we had a solution to that. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, yeah. Uh, I, lo I love that oftentimes we are in that, like, we say, oh, if we merge what someone did this week, then we're good. Yeah. That's basically the case. If we merge what Andrea did, we should be good, you know. Um, well, the, I, but but now we can just handle with some um, uh, conditions. What I love about this is that in the kind of continuum of users, you've got on the kind of like 
I'm just a software engineer. I know what I'm doing. You've got Chris with his LTK. On the uh, where's the on button? I don't know anything about computers side of things. You've got invent. And then what PyDOM is doing is kind of filling in the gap in between so that you've got a trajectory. Because the thing about learning is that it's always a journey. And if you've got a yes. if you've got a if you've got a ravine in the middle where you have no idea how to get across to the other side and continue your journey, then you're stymied. Really, it takes you know you have to. Cr- it, it's a it's a difficult learning experience. If there's stepping stones that yeah. get you to the next thing, this is a good thing. So I, I I think this is great. Actually, another thing I know we're at time. Uh, just just to share a couple of things that I I probably mentioned to Martin yesterday. There are two things actually that I, I'm exploring with this as well. One is I would like for these, well, I, I think there are benefits if these extensions declare themselves so that when you are in PyDOM and you say PyDOM select uh, element, and it happens to be the type of element that you mapped already, like a shoelace button or something, mm-hmm. you get actually an instance of the oh, shoelace think, button yeah. with that class with those properties, right? And it's actually quite easy to do that, I think, with PyDOM. Um, the second thing is going back to the concepts that are basically pre-built and pre-packaged. I also want to, to explore things that just feel natural for users to, to, to do. Like, for instance, Py, um, Shoelace have the concept of cards, but you need to take care of well, well, we, uh, when you have a collection, map your objects to a card and map your properties to, you know, the card header or description and things. What I'd like to do is like, oh, let, we can create a higher level concept of deck and you just pass an iterable and you say the keys where they map to and or a template, right? Like map the, the, the content here, the map, the header there, etc. So all the user needs to do is say deck pass a data a data frame or a list or a list of dictionaries and whatnot and then you, you, you just add to the DOM and it renders itself you know without knowing the, the underlying type and and all those things so I think there is where we can get a lot of leverage to users because it just it, it's zero friction you just pass things and they work but anyway this is the starting point cool that's all I had. So I feel that we are at the end of the agenda. So unless anybody has anything else to say, I think we can conclude the call. Thanks I, for I, would, I, I want to thank the sleepy at the wheel, but great driver. Great job, Antonio. Well, yeah, I, 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 was hoping, I was hoping to lose my driving license. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? This is what I did wonder. If I make a complete pig's ear of this chairing, they'll never ask me again. Well, <laughs> you should have. No, 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 no. I didn't do it on purpose. I actually tried, but I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Should I have opened a beer and you'll be driving under influence? And so no more license for you. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording. It was good. It was okay. Yeah, yeah, Excellent. yeah.